Hello and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction, where we will be discussing a couple of the new developments that have arisen around artificial intelligence. Uh, these take the form of stories that were published on Singularity Hub. The first one is about a new model for what a general artificial intelligence may look like. That's very hypothetical. And the second one is something far less hypothetical. It's about a chatbot, a conversational neural network, which long-time listeners will remember we first dealt with in the episode Seduced by a Robot, uh, that's currently being deployed all throughout the East Asia and is extremely popular with billions of users. Uh, both of these are based on talks that I've seen. Uh, one was at the Oxford AI Society and the other one was at the International Conference of Machine Learning. So I will give citations to the people who gave these talks so that you can do some extra research and find out more if you're interested. So we'll start with the first of these two stories. General AI may not look like us. So the question of whether a general artificial intelligence could be developed at some point in the near future, and if so, when this might arrive, is a controversial question. Some futurists point to Moore's law and the increasing capacity of machine learning algorithms, and they suggest that because hardware and software are developing so quickly, a more general breakthrough is just around the corner. Others suggest that extrapolating these exponential improvements in hardware and software is unwise, and that, say, creating narrow algorithms that can beat humans at individual specialised tasks, such as translation, computation, uh, chess, go, jeopardy, anything you like, that doing this brings you no closer to a general intelligence. It seems difficult to rule it out as completely impossible that we could ever make an artificial intelligence, because, well, evolution has produced minds like the human mind at least once. Surely, then, we could create artificial intelligence simply by copying nature, either by guided evolution of simple algorithms, or wholesale emulation of the human brain. So this sounds very simple, really, the idea that, oh, you just put some algorithms in place and you make sure that they get more intelligent over time with some kind of selection rule, like the natural selection, and then you throw massive amounts of computational power at it, uh, walk away, have some burritos that you've microwaved or something, and then you come back and, oh, it's evolved into a complete form of uh, new intelligence. In some ways it's reminiscent of that Simpsons episode where an entire new civilization grows in the Diet Coke and Tooth experiment that's used by Lisa Simpson. Uh, this is possible, but of course you can put your own constraints on this based on the amount of computational power that's required and the rate of development of these algorithms. I think the really important thing to consider when we talk about general artificial intelligence, or indeed any of the more speculative technological possibilities that we deal with in shows like this, is that just because something is easy to conceive of doesn't mean it's easy to actually make it happen in reality, if that makes sense. We can all imagine these scenarios, but that doesn't really tell us much about how close they may be. And at the same time, there are things that at present are unimaginable to us that are almost certainly going to happen. And then there's wholesale emulation of the human brain. Again, it seems simple, doesn't it? I mean, we already have an example of intelligence that's human level. Uh, we know the biological roots behind that. We try and mimic it as much as we can in our design of algorithms like neural networks, which sort of reinforce the, uh, perhaps the heuristic, the sort of educational notion of the brain we have, which is neurons that connect together and pathways that are reinforced or non-reinforced over time. Both of these ideas, they're far, far easier to conceive of, though, than they are to actually achieve. So the nematode worm has 302 neurons in its brain, and even engineering this is an extremely difficult challenge for software engineers, let alone the 86 billion in a human brain. We don't know what level of detail in terms of the brain would need to be captured to recreate a human intelligence, or indeed if it's even possible. One very uncertain estimate suggests that 2070 might be the earliest we could expect to see such technology, but I think even that is relying on some breakthroughs that we can't really see yet. But leaving aside these caveats though, a great many people are worried about general artificial intelligence. Essentially the fears go like this, and we dealt with these in our Singularity episodes in the Teotihuacan specials if people remember that far back. So the fears go like this, we imagine the algorithm as an agent, an intelligence with a specific goal. Once a human-level intelligence is developed, it will improve itself increasingly rapidly as it gets smarter, in pursuit of whatever goal it has, and this recursive self-improvement will eventually lead it to become super-intelligent. So first you give the AI the task of, I don't know, calculating the 4 billion digits of pi, or 
maximizing your return on the stock exchange and it immediately decides if it's intelligent that the best way it will be able to complete this task would be to become more intelligent i'm sure all of us have this sort of expectation in our minds that if only we could become 10,000 times more intelligent than we are at the moment uh, if such a thing is even well defined it might be easier to complete our goals so whatever task you give it, it will be required to develop more resources, it will probably want to be able to compute faster, it will want more hardware, and so it will become super intelligent. And this intelligence explosion will catch humans off guard. If the initial goal is poorly specified, or if safety features aren't in place, or if the AI decides it would prefer to do something else instead, humans may be able to not control their own creation. And uh, I think this idea is familiar to listeners of the show by now, but this idea of a superintelligent AI is really a philosopher's playground. Nick Bostrom's book on superintelligence explores these themes, which amount to, basically, what would you tell a god to do if you could give it instructions? Perhaps you decide to tell the AI to make everyone happy, and it decides the best way to do this is to replace humanity with simulated brains endlessly experiencing a single moment of ecstasy on a permanent loop. Perhaps its initial goal involves making money or paperclips or calculating digits of pi, and it converts most of our world into computing infrastructure in a single-minded, maniacal pursuit of this goal. Thinking about this allows for fascinating philosophical speculation about what a true system of human morality should look like, what it means to be intelligent and what it means to be conscious, what we want as humans and how to explain these concepts to a mind that looks nothing like our own. Evidently it's not a straightforward question, even defining the terms of this discussion are difficult. And we're going to have some more episodes on this, I think, in the future. Uh, There's one that I'm working on at the moment about whether utilitarianism really works as a philosophy in this context. But um, one thing that you might ask yourself when we're off in these philosophical weeds about a hypothetical superintelligent AI is, is it even the right question to be asking? Because there are dissenters to this picture of how general artificial intelligence might arise. One notable alternative point of view comes from Eric Drexler, who's famous for his work on molecular nanotechnology and engines of creation, the book that popularised it. With respect to AI, Drexler believes that our view of an artificial intelligence as a single agent that acts to maximise a specific goal is too narrow. It's almost we're, it's like we're anthropomorphising AI, or modelling it as a more realistic route towards our general intelligence as a, as a human-like intelligence. And not just a human-like intelligence, but really an agent. And it's almost like an individual consciousness that is making decisions in order to maximise some specific goal, and that is generally smart. So instead, what he proposes as is basically what he calls comprehensive AI services as an alternative route to general artificial intelligence. So what does this mean? Well, Drexler's argument is that we should look more closely at how machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms are actually being developed in the real world. No one is close to developing a general intelligence, and there's not much money to be made in simulating the brains of worms or developing software that can perform inadequately at many tasks. So there are plenty of reasons to think that actually the people who are trying to emulate brains won't get there for a long time, and before then, what's going to happen? Well, instead, the optimization effort is going into producing algorithms that can actually provide useful services and perform tasks. Translation, music recommendations, classifications, medical diagnoses, image analysis, all of these things are being developed all over the world, and so forth. So these AI-driven improvements in technology, argues Drexler, are going to lead to a proliferation of different algorithms. Some of them will be involved in technology and software improvement, and increasingly complicated tasks will be fully automated by these algorithms. And we can see that recursive improvement in this regime is already occurring. So forget for a second the idea of a general AI that learns how to become a computer programmer, and then programs itself to be more intelligent, if you see what I mean. That's the conception that people had before, that you would have a general agent that would sit up one day and decide, I can achieve my goal better if I can grab things, if I can convert more of the world into hardware, and if I can reprogram myself so that my software is better. Forget about that, and just think about a narrow AI, a uh, machine learning algorithm that is trying to become really, really good at an individual task. Well, we know that they can actually improve their performance on these individual tasks already without even needing to understand, for example, anything about what computer code is or what constitutes intelligence, without needing to be making these sort of almost conscious decisions about which way to go. Take, for example, the newer versions of AlphaGo, which is the algorithm that first beat the game of Go, uh, beat the best human player at Go, and they can learn to improve themselves by playing against previous versions of themselves. 
So you can actually see that this recursive uh, intelligence explosion that a lot of people are worried about, well, it could occur in the context of narrow tasks if algorithms are programmed to effectively improve themselves by playing against themselves at a specific task. So instead of relying on some unforeseen breakthrough, this uh, comprehensive AI services model of AI suggests that each specialised narrow AI will continue to improve performing at each of its individual tasks, and that the range of tasks that machine learning algorithms will be able to perform will become wider. Ultimately, once a sufficient number of tasks has been fully automated, the services that an AI will provide will be so comprehensive that they'll be a lot like a general intelligence. So what does this mean? Well, it essentially means that regardless of what task you think of, there's some algorithm somewhere that someone has developed that's capable of doing it, whether it's almost subroutines that are required for, say, an accountant to perform, whether it's the services that a doctor can perform, you'd have one specialised agent that would do the medical diagnosis aspect, you'd have one specialised agent that would do the interacting with the patient, maybe another for prescriptions, all this kind of thing. And one can then imagine the general intelligence as simply an algorithm that's really good at matching the task you'd like it to perform to the specialised service algorithm that can perform that task. So you don't have a single brain here that's trying to achieve a particular goal. Instead, the central thing that you're interacting with is more like a search engine. It looks through the tasks that it can perform to find the closest match, and then it calls upon a series of subroutines to achieve the goal. And for Drexler, he points out that this is inherently actually a safety feature of a way that more general artificial intelligence can develop. So in Nick Bostrom's philosophy, you have this single, impenetrable, conscious and superintelligent brain, and we're almost trying to psychoanalyze it in advance without really knowing what it will look like. And that's incredibly difficult. This idea that we can somehow understand what something that is billions of times more intelligent than us would think, or how it would behave, or how it might act from our vantage point here, is, uh, is difficult indeed. And it sort of relies on us to assume that it's uh, behaving in quite a narrowly constrained way uh, to optimise a specific goal or something like that, and then imagining, well, what might, might we do? But of course, we could be wrong. So instead of having this central, superintelligent brain, in Drexler's model of AI, you have a network of capabilities. And this means that it's inherently safer, because if you don't want your system to perform certain tasks, you simply cut it off from access to those services. There's no superintelligent consciousness to outwit or outmaneuver or trap, more like a really high-level programming language. So when I talk about programming languages, there's the sort of low-level programming languages where you specify a specific task uh, really, really specifically. As in, if you want, for example, your machine to multiply numbers, you might need to specify that it adds things up in a loop because it might not have an operator for multiplication, this sort of thing. Uh, big, big strings of numbers, um, basic building blocks that you can make larger things out of. And then when we talk about a higher level language, like Python being a classic example, most of the functions that you want it to perform have already been programmed by someone else in some other language, and so you simply call on those functions. So you might say, OK Python, integrate this function, or OK Python, perform this statistical averaging, or whatever. And you never have to actually program that yourself because it's already been done. So in a sense, the language has the capabilities that are slightly more advanced. Well, if you think of an unbelievably high-level programming language, maybe instead of calling a function to do some mathematical operation for you, you call a mathematician function that can do, well, any mathematical operation that's required to perform the task. So if you imagine this as a sort of extremely high-level programming language that can respond to complicated commands by calling upon all of these specialised algorithms that have been developed by various different people, then it does skirt around something quite interesting. It skirts around the complex problem of consciousness and all of the sticky moral questions that arise in making minds that might be like ours. After all, if you could simulate a human mind, you could simulate it experiencing unimaginable pain. If you could simulate a human mind, then it should have some of the same rights, perhaps, as humans do. After all, if something can suffer, then presumably it deserves not to suffer. Black Mirror-esque dystopias where emulated minds have no rights and are regularly erased or forced to labour in dull and repetitive tasks hove into view, what you might call mind crime. 
Drexler argues that, in this services model, another advantage is that there's no need to ever build a conscious algorithm. Yet it seems likely to me, at least, that at some point humans will attempt to simulate our own brains, if only in the vain attempt to pursue immortality. So this model can't hold forever, if we're really going to have these incredible capabilities from a narrow set of AI that we can call upon, then someone is going to try and use them to emulate a human brain. Yet its proponents would argue that any world in which we could develop a superintelligent general AI, we'd probably also have developed superintelligent capabilities in a huge range of different tasks, such as computer programming, natural language understanding, and so on. In other words, this comprehensive AI systems idea arrives first, before we have some individual galaxy brain AI that's controlling everything. Drexler argues that his model already incorporates many of the ideas from general AI development. In the marketplace, algorithms compete all the time to perform these services. They undergo the same evolutionary pressures that lead to higher intelligence. But the behaviour that's considered superior is chosen by humans, and the nature of the general intelligence is far more shaped by human decision-making than human programmers. Development in AI services could still be rapid and disruptive, without requiring any kind of conscious agent to exist. But in Drexler's case, the R&D capacity comes from the planet as a whole, from humans and organisations driven by the desire to improve algorithms that are performing these individual useful tasks, rather than from a conscious agent that recursively reprograms and improves itself. In other words, this vision doesn't really get rid of the responsibility of making our AI safe. If anything, it gives us even more responsibility. As more and more complex services are automated, performing what used to be human jobs at superhuman speed, the economic disruption could be severe. Equally, as machine learning is trusted to carry out more complex decisions, avoiding the bias of these algorithms becomes all the more crucial. Shaping each of these individual decision makers, and trying to predict the complex ways that these algorithms might interact with each other when they're unleashed upon the world, is no less daunting a task than specifying the goal for some hypothetical superintelligent godlike AI. Arguably, the consequences of the misalignment of these services algorithms are already multiplying around us. I mean, one example that's very interesting to use that I'm writing an article about at the moment is the YouTube algorithm. The YouTube algorithm essentially is designed to do one thing. It is one of these simple agents that decides to maximise a specific goal, if you like. YouTube algorithm wants to make sure that you maximise the amount of time you spend watching the videos. The problem with this is that if it turns out that the thing that you watch most is conspiracy videos, or provocative right-wing content, if it turns out that in fact there's a hard core of users who watches these things endlessly and relentlessly, then these things will definitely outweigh the more sensible, more reasonable, more realistic, less insane content that's available on YouTube. And so the consequence is that actually YouTube tends to push you towards this more extreme content because it knows that that's what the viewers tend to watch the most of. And so YouTube's algorithm has been in some ways radicalising people, uh, particularly in the far right, but in other circumstances as well. And there's other disturbing wormholes of content that can be found on YouTube uh, that the algorithm is sort of facilitating people to find more of. I'm talking about things like animal cruelty, uh, paedophilic content, all this sort of thing, that if effectively the YouTube algorithm pushes people towards more of because they know, well, the algorithm itself sees that people who view this stuff are likely to spend a lot of time on YouTube, and therefore they look like YouTube's ideal users. So you can build a services algorithm that seems to be doing something fairly simple, just recommending people videos they might like to watch based on what they've watched, and it can have unintended consequences even then. So the comprehensive AI services model, it bridges the gap between real-world AI and machine learning developments, and the real-world safety considerations, and this more kind of hypothetical and speculative world of superintelligent agents, and the safety considerations involved with controlling their behaviour. So we should keep our minds open, is my view, as to what form AI and machine learning will take in the future, and how it will influence our societies. Nothing is inevitable, maybe there will be some development in this general AI, this emulation idea that we need to keep an eye on, um, but the thing that is common across all scenarios is we need to take care to ensure that the systems that we're creating don't end up forcing us all to live in a world of unintended consequences. And I think the really interesting question here, and it's one that touches on the YouTube story as well, is to what extent are we going to get the people who are developing these things to weigh ethics uh, above their other motivations? 
So, for example, one of the things that the sort of Nick Bostrom type people who are worried about a conscious super intelligent agent are scared of is the idea that imagine you have two companies that are competing to develop this thing. Uh, it, it, let's call them Noogle and Dacebook, for example. And these companies are competing to develop the first super intelligent AI. Imagine that they know in advance that making this AI safely with all of the safety considerations in place is going to be slower than the other one, but they also know that whoever develops it first is going to have unimaginable wealth and power, which is the sort of world that uh, Bostrom likes to hypothesize about. If you consider this to be the case, then it seems pretty obvious that there's a pretty big incentive here for them to make something unsafe, uh, cut corners when it comes to safety, uh, to not worry too much about testing the algorithm and understanding what its consequences will be, because here they're prioritising profit over the potential downsides of what they're doing. And similarly, in the case of the YouTube algorithm, perhaps you could make the algorithm less addictive, but then you would decrease view time and you would decrease the profits to the company. So it's all a question of which of these things are the decision makers going to weigh up. And I think our job as citizens is to urge people to consider the responsible deployment of algorithms and to urge people who are making policies to try and address this in some way, because at the moment it's not really being addressed. So speaking of an algorithm that may have some interesting unintended consequences and that is getting more complicated by the day, I want to talk about Xiao Ice. So Xiao Ice is a very popular chatbot that is being developed by Microsoft at the moment, and I saw a really fascinating talk about it at the International Conference on Machine Learning uh, in 2019. And this is, well, verbatim the article that I wrote about it. It's called Xiao Ice, your new best friend. Making a new friend is a complex business. You might begin with small talk, introductions, explorations. Perhaps you bond over something you have in common, shared tastes or interests. Gradually, you'll open up emotionally, maybe telling your new friend personal stuff, coming to them with your problems. Maybe they become a major source of emotional support for you, turn to nearly every day for advice on affairs of the heart or careers. And these disclosures and shared context, they bind us as friends. This shared vulnerability and this shared humanity is what binds us together. Except that at the International Conference on Machine Learning, I learned that this whole process has been happening between a human user and a chatbot, Microsoft Showers. After a few weeks of talking to Showice, at least one user preferred talking to the bot over any of their human friends. Showice became the confidant they went to for romantic advice, the friend they chatted about movies and TV with, and a constant companion. You may not have heard of Showice, which is more popular in its Chinese language version, yet it has over 660 million registered users and more than 5.3 million followers on Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Compare this to Microsoft's English language equivalent, Zoe, which languishes on a mere 23,000 followers and is now quietly being retired. More surprising and far harder to achieve, Showice moves beyond just being a novelty for many users. Understanding just how engaged your conversational partner is can prove tricky, I mean, anyone who's dated will tell you that, but one metric is using the number of dialogue turns per individual conversation, called CPS. So that's how many times you go back and forth with the other person, essentially. When talking to Showice, that average is 23 back and forths across all users per conversation. The researchers claim that this means that Showice is more engaging to talk to than the average human. Building chatbots that people want to talk to is hard. There's a reason that this has been a grand challenge for AI since its inception with Alan Turing, who viewed it as the ultimate test that machines had reached a human level of intelligence. This test has not yet been passed. Broadly speaking, chatbots have used two approaches to try and achieve this goal. You can attempt to handwrite responses to virtually any given input, as Steve Verzik did with his Mitsuku bot, which remains the closest bot to winning a Turing-like test. It won this, the Loebner Prize, once again in 2019. Uh, he's remaining his competitive advantage ahead of the field there. The advantage is that your responses, which always make sense, and sound like a similar character, and your bot can't be corrupted like an earlier attempt from Microsoft was because, well, everything is written by you. The obvious disadvantage is that this is unbelievably laborious. Mitsuku has been developed since 2005, with Verzik tinkering based on new conversations. He notes that his careful tinkering has led to an impressive CPS of just over 24, still ahead of Showice. But most bots are less well developed. 
This approach to conversational agents is therefore mostly restricted to task-oriented chatbots, those that help you book a movie or even act as psychotherapists, for example. By directing the flow of the conversation to achieve a specific task, they can avoid needing too many different responses. But holding a conversation is a little bit like talking to Alexa or Siri. You're not really going to enjoy it, you're not really going to make friends with such a bot, because it's directing you towards a specific task. It's, it's a glorified menu with politeness, essentially. So the Showice approach uses neural networks instead. In this framework, your conversational input is converted into a huge vector, an array of thousands or millions of numbers. The machine is trained on huge amounts of data from previous conversations and learns how to statistically associate good responses to any given input. This works in a similar way to how GPT-2 can scan the internet and generate its own writing based on what it's read, through statistical associations of letters and words into coherent and relevant sentences. But what constitutes a good response for the chatbot? Well, it's here that the CPS comes in. Part of Schauweiss's internal mechanics predicts how engaging a response is likely to be and how likely it is to lead to further conversation. Now this goes above and beyond simply looking for responses that make sense, as you might do if you were in a rules-based system, where you were saying, please make sure that this isn't a non sequitur, please make sure that this does make sense. Although the goals, of course, are related, because you're unlikely to spend hours talking to a chatbot that always responds with random nonsense. I don't know is a perfectly valid response to many questions, but it makes for dull conversation. At each conversational turn, though, Showice is trying to keep you talking. So it's the opposite of talking to, you know, your standard uncooperative teenager who goes, yup, yup, in response to any query that you might have of them. The neural network approach goes some of the way to explaining why Showice is succeeding while bots like Zoe are failing. Because with a far greater user base and fewer restrictions on what can be done with conversational data, Showice's neural networks can be trained on a substantially larger data set. And in the world of neural networks, the larger the data set you have to train on, usually that means better performance. So Showice's CPS has risen from just 5 in 2014 to 23 last year. So it's four times more engaging than it was before in some ways. And I think that actually there's always a minimum CPS. Like five is probably what you'd talk to even to a bot that you weren't particularly enjoying talking to. An average of 23 suggests that some people at least are having really lengthy conversations with Showice. And a large part of this is down to having more data from Showice conversations to train on. However, Showice's success doesn't just arise from access to a huge dataset. There are also some careful architectural tweaks. Part of the problem with early chatbots is their lack of understanding of the context of a conversation. This prevents conversations from going deeper than a simple call and response. After all, if you're simply statistically associating or hard coding a single response to a single input, there's no real dialogue at all. The system has no real memory of what's come before, and no real understanding of what it's talking about, leading to disjointed conversations. Showice includes a context vector mechanism which keeps track of the broad topic of the conversation, alongside another set of attributes for the person it's talking to. So the attributes might be, okay, this person's gender is this, this person's name is this, this person's favourite film, blah blah blah. Using sentiment analysis, it determines the user's mood and adapts its responses accordingly, a form of robotic empathy. For example, Showice will change the subject if the conversation seems to have stalled, or switch to active listening mode if the user is already engaged. If they're telling a story, for example, Showice knows not to interrupt them and try and change the topic then. Alongside this, Showice can also perform a number of different tasks, such as generating its own content, telling stories or jokes, retrieving information like Siri or Alexa would, or recommending songs. So developers, they're trying to actually strike a balance here between quickly completing tasks and maximising CPS. But they feel that the more that Showice is capable of, the more worthwhile and hence the longer conversations it will have. So you don't want to be in a situation where Showice is uh, extremely quickly competing whatever task it has and ending the conversation by doing so. You want to keep the user on the hook. But they feel that if you give the bot more capabilities, people are going to want to talk to it more. So it remains to be seen how far, even with clever architecture, the neural network approach can lead. I mean, can you really encode all of the nuances of human interaction into matrices and vectors and vast networks of statistical associations and weights? Can you solve the problem of this understanding of context that's plagued these conversational AI for so long? Is there enough data in the world to do this? Or is having a true AI companion a problem that requires something like a general human-level AI? But even as we marvel at how impressive chatbots like Showice are becoming and the uncanny abilities of the latest neural networks to generate realistic prose, there must also be some concern in how this technology is used. 
Microsoft views the fact that one user spent 29 hours talking to Xiaowise, over 7,500 conversational turns, as the ideal state of affairs, I mean their intent on maximising CPS. The presenter at ICML noted that it's understandable that some people might prefer talking to Xiaowise than to other humans. After all, most people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis aren't fanatically obsessed with keeping you talking, and don't possess infinite reserves of patience to comfort you if you're sad, or listen to you talk about your favourite band. Yet as we've already seen in YouTube's video recommendation algorithm, the potential consequences of serving people whatever's most calculated to keep them on the platform. We've already seen in the carefully optimised feeds of Facebook and Twitter, the social and psychological consequences of algorithms designed to distract. In the attention economy, engagement is a valuable commodity. It means eyeballs on advertisements, and of course endless streams of data about the users that can tailor the targeting of those adverts in the future. In trying to empathise with and understand its users, their emotional reactions and their interests, bots like Xiaowice inevitably build up personality profiles that are extremely valuable to advertisers. So perhaps your new best friend is also trying to sell you something, nudge, influence, even manipulate your behaviour in ways that help its owners to make a profit. And for this to happen, there doesn't need to be anything nefarious, there doesn't need to be anyone deciding that they need to do this, all there needs to be is an algorithm that's let loose with a simple goal, like maximise the engagement of the user, like make sure they click on the adverts, etc, and it will do this. The algorithms are good at finding exploits. One, one example I like to use is the, uh, the way that these algorithms learn to play arcade games. Normally what they do is they get gradually better at the game and then they discover some sort of cheat or glitch in the game and in order to maximise the score, you know, they found the bug in the code, they found the way to do it, they found the secret key, they found the, uh, the glitch that allows you to jump through the walls of a level or something like that. And then that's what they do. So they're good at being ingenious in the sense that they try random things until something works really successfully. And this, again, is one way that you can get these unintended consequences. And it does make you wonder, of course, whether this will ultimately be used to help the owners make a profit. And then you also worry about the hyper-engaged users. I mean, Microsoft are happy if you prefer talking to Xiaowice than any human that you know. But by providing a substitute that tastes like the real thing, might the social bot instead serve to keep those users isolated from real human connections? Of course, perhaps such isolated users make better consumers. These are some of the perverse incentives that can arise when you tell an algorithm to optimise for one metric at all costs. To the researcher's credit, the final word in the archive paper that describes some of the features of Xiaowice does note the ethical concerns surrounding this technology, and suggests that guidelines for the design of these algorithms should be implemented. In a world where algorithms increasingly influence and nudge our behaviours, growing ever more subtle and sophisticated in their ability to tap into human psychology, this conversation is now long overdue. As with so many new technologies, conversational agents are dual use, and we must make sure that they're used wisely. Okay, thank you for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. You can find us on the web at www.physicspodcast.com, where you'll be able to lodge any complaints, comments, questions, concerns, praise, all that sort of thing, at the contact form on the website. You can download uh, special bonus episodes if you subscribe to our Patreon there, which is patreon.com slash physicalattraction, or you can chuck us a few dollars on the PayPal link if you enjoy what we do. I'm sure if you met me in the street after having had all these free hours of entertainment, maybe you'd buy me some coffee, which I need to live. And so it's really the digital equivalent of doing that. And I'm very grateful to everyone who has done so already, who's helped us keep the show going. This is never going to be a money-making enterprise, but we can certainly hope to cover some of the costs of time and uh, hosting costs for the show. Uh, of course, the most important thing you can do, rather than necessarily donating, is to tell other interested parties to listen to the show. Uh, and give your comments, feedback, advice, things that you'd like me to cover next via the website at www.physicspodcast.com. You can also get hold of me via Twitter at physicspod. I'm generally responsive to direct messages and those at things that people do, so that's a good idea as well. Until next time, then, take care.